Hi, friends. Thanks for joining us. Please do us a favor and smash that subscribe button. Many thanks for an amazing week of growth during the Grey Cup. Benny, where can they find us on social media? Yeah, you can check us out. We're on Reddit, or sorry, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Of course, we're also on Reddit and Discord as well. Uh, and leave us a rating on your uh, favorite podcast provider. We're here to do a Grey Cup review, as painful as that <laughs> might be. Um, and, and also, you know, um, we're also fans, you know, we're not analysts. We aren't required to be unbiased or objective or whatever. So as fans, it's damn difficult to go through this, but jeez. Uh, especially after that second half, son of a bunch. So let's look at yesterday's game. What went wrong? What were the factors that led to the bomber loss? Uh, what did Montreal s- successfully do to win? Yeah, first off, I'll say congrats to Montreal. Congrats to the Alouettes for uh, winning the Great Cup, to their fans, everything. It, it was, it's a tough way to go down for as a bomber fan, but congrats to them for winning it. Um, yeah, a lot went wrong for the bombers, unfortunately. Uh, too many mistakes, like we talked about, if they were going to make mistakes on offense. You know, Montreal was going to capitalize um, the uh, fumble early in the game by Oliveira. You know, that's step one of making a mistake. Um, another one was the uh, late Kalaros interception. Not the late Kalaros interception, the second half interception. Um, third quarter there where they drove downfield and they were driving probably their best drive um, since that first drive almost, or, or, you know, that they got down in field goal range. And unfortunately, he went for the gold there and, and didn't get enough air under that and couldn't get it to Waller. And he had other options. You know, so again, mistakes uh, piled up for the Bombers and they just couldn't get it done. Yeah, there are many plays. They can be cataloged aplenty of uh, what happened. I think they shot themselves in the foot. Again, that's not taking anything away from Montreal. Congrats to them. They played a great game. Also, not a perfect game, but it just seems the Bombers couldn't get over their own mistakes. Um, For me personally, this is a little petty, a little ticky tack, but revisiting last week's points about slogans and hashtags. (laughs) Last week... I said I hated it and I didn't use it because of what happened before in 2002. Yeah. Those are pretty much the exact words I said last week. Yeah. And so this year we go into the game with reclaim the throne and it just reeks of unfinished business. And it's not that I'm a superstitious person. Oh, the football gods are going to frown upon the bombers. Okay. You know what? Yeah. 50%. Yeah. It's that. But the other 50% is it doesn't jive with the way Mike O'Shea has been running this team. It's been a week by week, let's go one and O oh, and not worry about what's ahead of us. From the beginning of the playoffs, it's been about hashtag reclaim this throne. And it wasn't about winning that week or what's going on in the week or the game ahead. So I really hated that. And I don't, I'm not saying it's the reason they lost, obviously, but it just really irks me as a fan. I got under my skin. I agree with you. Ever since that unfinished business crap, I, I've kind of hated them as well. And it's just like, just go out and play football, win, win the game. Don't worry about anything else. I know it's just social media created and it's not even really a part of the football operation kind of thing, right? But it just kind of gets to you a little bit. So I do agree with you on that one. No, but it has to be like in marketing, it has to be a symbiosis of football operations and marketing. You yeah. have to be on the same page. And if your leader of football is saying we are going one and oh, we go week by week, you don't start thinking about the Grey Cup championship when you even haven't even beaten the BC Lions yet with Reclaim the Throne. It just, it sends an attitude. It helps frame what you're doing. And I just thought it was kind of a fault of the organization. But Let's talk about football because there's plenty of stuff that went wrong. You talked about the fumble uh, and offense. They just couldn't get things going. I don't know if Buck Pierce had a very good offensive plan going into the game. And it just seems like they did made minimal changes at halftime. Minimal, uh, what do you call those things? Adjustments. Um, you know, fortunately for them on that first touchdown, they got that roughing penalty. Yeah. Because that drive was stalling and they got away from the power running game. That killed me. That killed me. Where was a heavy set when they needed it? It was ridiculous. They could have easily pounded Montreal all game long, and they got away from the running game. And Oliver was 19 for over 100 yards. Why they went away from the power running game, I have no idea. Yeah, and he kind of didn't come out and really say it, but he kind of alluded to the fact of what you know, where did the running game kind of go. I um, mean, especially when he got the ball back with two uh, something left. You know, that's when you use your heavy set and pound into that D-line and try and get that first down. I know they ran on the first play, didn't get much, but that's your bread and butter, you know? And then the second down play just wasn't very good. Like when you're not even getting a pass off on your second down play to try and kill the game, you know, that's a terrible play call right there. And and like you say, they capitalized on that rough in the passer call, which was bogus. Um, They capitalized on the fumbled punt which people questioned as well. But to me, that it's too hard to tell if they're in the five-yard zone anyways. Oh, yeah. 
So really their only good drive, I, I mean, the one driving an interception and the only good one was the late fourth quarter drive one where they ended up with a touchdown to take the lead again. So this yeah. bomber offense was missing in action for a lot of this game. Um, even on that second uh, TD drive, Claros almost threw an interception as well. He had Wolitarski open in the end zone and again, threw it again on the run to his right, you know, just like the interception of Lawler and threw it and just not getting enough power on those or whatever, or he, you know, I don't know what he's doing there, but he almost threw two interceptions right there. You know, and it just, it wasn't fluid. The offense was not fluid. Montreal's D, the bully ball we always talk about, Montreal's D was bringing out bully balls. There were some big hits, uh, Ugwak on uh, Oliveira, and then uh, later on, someone, uh, I think it was Sankey on Dembski. Like, yeah. there was just some big hits. Montreal was bringing it. Um, and I don't know what they did to this offense, but, you know, they they brought, Montreal brought it, and Bomber's offense just kind of shied away. Yeah, and and without using the run early, you can't really establish a play action. And that doesn't open things up, especially in the second half of the game, when the other team has made adjustments to what they saw in the first half. Uh, so, I don't know, Buck Pierce, it wasn't the best game that he has called, I don't think. And um, oh, there was this analyst on TSN, he used to be a CIAU quarterback or whatever in 2013 or so, and he was talking about Zach Caleros making adjustments at the line. And that didn't seem to happen. It seemed like they're going up and they did their play and, you know, good or not, there were no adjustments. So I don't know. It, it seems like the Bombers kind of laid back on this one. No adjustments were made. And he uh, gave up, he gave up four sacks, uh, Hardrick, a couple of whiffs on, on some opportunities and almost led to a Claros fumble on one of them. I don't know how Claros even hung on to that. We talked about it, the trenches here and the Bombers lost it on both sides of the ball on offense. They couldn't yeah. block well enough. Uh, on defense, they couldn't get through to Fajardo, which shocked the heck out of me, really. That was the biggest thing for me in this game, is the fact that that D-line was not getting through and sacking Fajardo and how much time Fajardo had to look downfield and make those big plays downfield. Because I, I thought that O-line, or sorry, that D-line was going to chew up that Montreal O-line. I don't know what Montreal did adjustment-wise or what they figured out, but wow, did they really put a stop to this D-line. <laughs> It's funny. I call for the Bombers to use a heavy set almost on a weekly basis. What does Montreal use on the screenplay to get Mac Austin or whatever Austin uh, Mac Austin into Mac. the touchdown? He got a bubble screen because of using a heavy set. And not only a heavy set, they added a fullback to the heavy set. Seven linemen. So come on, Bombers. Wasn't I don't know it, why they didn't use that. Wasn't it done on the Steinbeck run as well? Because it looked like he had some good blocking on that. Jeez. I guess the left side of the Montreal line. Uh, for him to get outside. There was like three Montreal guys keeping all the Bombers uh, D-line linebackers kind of in place. It was a greatly blocked play and Stanback just went. That was another thing with the D-line and, and the Bombers defense in general. Stanback was getting five yards uh, every time yeah. he carried at least. You know, th there was a lot of second and shorts. Um, and, and Winnipeg just couldn't stop Montreal on those uh, here and there. And then again, late in the game, second and 18. How are you letting Fajardo get away you know, when you posted a clip reminiscent of last year with uh, Chad Kelly getting away and getting into field goal range and all that. And it just let you got second and 18. You, you got the bomber D. You're thinking, OK, they got this. They're going to put this away. And then unfortunately, they just couldn't hang on. And, you know, what, props props to the two tackles on uh, Montreal who held these guys in tech. Uh, you, you mentioned calendar last week or last episode as well. So they did a great job. And Montreal's guys stepped up. The guys and that it's they not, need to stepped up. And it's not that they were... Okay, the, the Bombers did not get too many sacks, but they were getting in Fajardo's face. But the, protect, the, the, the secondary, the protection in the secondary would break down every time. Yeah. So uh, Fajardo would take a step to the left, step to the right, just to get another extra second, and someone would be open. I don't know. It's, some great uh, catches by those Montreal receivers too, man. Awesome. Like, Actually, they made some nice ones, so... The coverage on these plays, like there was a third and five late after that second and whatever big run. The guy was 10 yards off of they needed five yards. Oh, it was crazy. And then they go deep. Uh, anyway, uh, well, son of a gun. See, now I'm getting upset. When and I, when I looked at the rest sir, or sorry, just to go back to that play there that you're talking about, the uh, third and five, um, watching TSN's highlights, it's hard to tell exactly, but it looks like Parker starts to step up and take the receiver who stopped at the five yard marker and home was probably that guy. I don't know if home or Parker messed up or what there. And then Parker realized, Hey, I got to, it's, th that's my guy. 
And at that point, it was too late. The guy already had five yards on him. Um, yeah, that was just a ter- another mistake by that bomber D and uh, by the DBs who who got beat all game. No DB was actually good in this game. Houston got beat a lot. Uh, home had the interception, but it was almost like a punt, anyways. So it was it was it wasn't a good game all around by the bombers. And it's not just the DBs; it's the coverage that's being called in the situations. Why are you playing man tight like that and then having so much space in between the receiver and the DB? That makes absolutely no sense. Yeah, even if they took the short ball, they would have got the first down there. Montreal. So, and then you got Big Hill covering downfield on the receiver on the second touchdown. <laughs> the guy who's kind of crippled in the game and hurt and all that stuff. And then you have him covering a wide receiver down the field. That didn't make sense either. So, uh, lost opportunities. A lot of all lost opportunities for the Bombers in this game. Nope. They didn't score when they had the chance. They didn't establish the running game and they didn't use the running game correctly. I was talking about Buck Pierce and his play calling it not being, it's a little bland and vanilla. It's just like they use one jet sweep in the third and it worked great with Dembski. Why weren't they using that more often? Yeah. Like it got stopped once in the first by uh, Lemon and they stopped using it for a long time. Why not use Janarian Grant on those bubble screens? You know, yeah, just uh, so disappointing. Yeah, Montreal, you seem to use everybody on offense. Like every receiver got something. Uh, Fajardo was throwing out quick passes and all that on top, passes to the flat. And the Bombers just didn't have an answer for it. And they were getting at least five to six yards, you know, and second downs were a lot easier. And, and I mean, the defense held them a lot as well. But when when they needed to hold them, they they just didn't at the end of it. And then the Bombers' offense, again, both sides of it. But the punt coverage team or kick coverage team, again, iffy here and there the punting in this game by both sides was atrocious i don't know what was happening on on either side with these punters but uh you know richie just... hall and the lack of creativity <laughs> with the blitz too like you know i talk about the secondary and talk the lack of pressure with the front but the blitz sometimes he has all these players in the blitz not hiding it fajardo sees it and he passes over it the only time that worked is when he dropped three or four guys into coverage and that confused fajardo yeah like <laughs> Come on, like uh, the coaching, I think, failed pretty big time. And that's, again, from the stands, from a fan's point of view. Yeah, there's there's a lot of blame to go around in the loss of this one. It's not just one thing or one player or anything like that. No one looked crisp. Um, you know, I don't know, tons of mistakes. It's unfortunate for the Bombers. Again, you, you know, if you look back at their great cups, the one they won, the first one, they were the underdogs. They beat Hamilton handily, you know, and then the, and the last one, then they won beat Hamilton again. They almost blew it at the end, too, in that one, uh, but they ended up winning in overtime because Hamilton settled for a field goal. Like, Montreal had to drive 83 yards in less than two minutes to win this game. Yes, they could have settled for a field goal at any point and sent it to overtime, but they went for the gusto. And you, you know what? They drove on this defense, which has been very good all year in under two minutes to score uh, and put this game away. And, you know, props to Fajardo. He looked good. He took what the defense gave him. Uh, besides that interception, he didn't really make any mistakes. Yeah. Fajardo was decent. Uh, there were so many big open windows that the Bombers left uh, defensive-wise. Uh, just the way Montreal came out in the third. Uh, offensively, they are a little more decisive, purposeful. Uh, I don't know. Well, yeah, you, you think about that stop before halftime. You think about that, you're thinking, okay, this is going to pump the Bombers up. Uh, we stopped Montreal on third and goal at the goal line. And then also Montreal comes out and they score quickly. Like, no issue at all. Like, time of possession in this game was 15 minutes more for the Bombers. Um, but everything else was pretty close to being similar. Like, they're just, Bombers just didn't do enough. Montreal so wanted this Montreal more. Montreal do? came out stronger, man. So what did Montreal do? Jeez. Well, obviously, Stanback was able to get the running game going. His tap, his touchdown happened because of good blocking and also because he made someone miss. That's your job as a running back, especially yep. when it's one on one. Make the guy miss. He made a miss and then he beat the rest of the team to the end zone. The Bombers were getting pressure like to Fajardo, like I mentioned, but he didn't make a mistake with the ball. Even the interception that you mentioned that he did, that was a beautiful pick by Evan Holm, yeah. an athletic yeah. pass. That was crazy. That was like a 50-50 ball that the Montreal guy probably should have gotten if he established body business and jumped for the ball. Oh, man. Austin Mack was unstoppable. Demarius Houston kind of had a bad game, even on the last touchdown, which wasn't against Austin Mack, but against Phil Pot. It looked yeah. like Demarius Houston jumped for the ball rather than played through the ball in the player. Again, that's from the fan, from the crowd. I don't know. I could be very wrong. Um, 
It's just, Montreal did so much wrong. So much good. wrong or Sorry, so much right? So much yeah. good. Yeah. Great coverage on Caleros. Like yeah. Caleros was holding the ball for how many of those sacks? At least half of them. Half of them. They were just covering Bombers receivers. Blanket coverage is beautiful. I wish yeah. Caleros could have used his legs more. You know, if he could have used his legs more like Fajardo, they could have at least kept some of these drives going. And why not use Brady Oliveira in the flats? Why not use him in the passing game like they did before in BC and pre uh man, so much. Well, yeah, it's amazing to look at that BC game and go nine, what is nine sacks, ten sacks. I keep hearing different numbers all the time. Um, and then only getting Fajardo twice in this. And even if they got a bunch of pressures, uh, they just didn't make enough plays for it. And Montreal got it, got it done. And the catches by their receivers, Mac made a couple beautiful catches. They weren't the great. Like Fajardo sometimes seemed like he was just throwing this ball up. Uh, but his receivers beat our DBs to these balls and, and made some great plays. They took the line of the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. Um until with the interception and the fumble caused fumble like that interception to me i keep watching it and i'm like oh man lawler's wide open you know like you just get it back there and even if at least you throw lawler wide open or uh throw overthrow him at least it you know it drops to the ground you know it's not an interception but and you had dembski uh, open right at the goal line on the flat you had him you had him there you could have just taken that it's first down even if he doesn't get in, you live to you know play second oh, down. So. He was getting in. Yeah, that was a clean I, 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 run I know he was to getting in, the yes. end zone. He was, and I, oh, I, was man, to I talked about that. this last week as well. Caleros in November, especially in the Grey Cup, has not been spectacular. No, and this is a zero touchdown, one interception performance with receivers open to finish drives within the twenty yard line. Oh yeah, yeah. Even even the last drive, the two minutes left there, about when they had the ball back to try to kill the game, he got sacked. But it was more mostly because he ran into the bomber uh, lineman and the and Sankey, I think it was, that were engaged. And then Sankey just grabbed them. It's like, dude, you could have got around maybe the edge. I know there was another Montreal guy there, but maybe you get a few more yards or something happens. But yeah, he just didn't look like his normal self with the scrambling or or, or anything like that. You know, so no. uh, tough tough outing for him, unfortunately. And we cannot, uh, not many people are talking about it, but the lack of depth on that wide receiver core or the receiver core, you know, they're riddled by injuries. I'm sure Dembski wasn't 100%. Bailey wasn't 100%. He didn't, his name didn't come up often. Shown definitely wasn't 100%. So I think know, Bailey playing against a very hot defense, a defense that went 6 7 and 0 to end the season. Man, how familiar is this to 2001 with a team going hot into the playoffs and finishing off the Bombers? Oh, yeah. man. I, I think uh, Bailey was the only one that they announced. He had a hamstring tear. Um, I think that's what I saw today. So, so don't wanna, they never mentioned what, what's up with Sean or, or Biggie or anything like that, but that's a pretty big hit to your hamstring right there to be able to play. So Bombers not at 100% here, but yeah. Again, so what do you, it's that's... it's about being hot. It's it's hot going into the playoff. You're the underdog. You know you can pick Montreal to win this game, but you're you're not risking anything, right? Because you're just saying if they lose, they lose. You're like, wow, they were expected to lose, right? It's just they got hot at the right time, and that D just you know played very well. And Fajardo and that offense did, did the unexpected. So everyone thought if Montreal was going to win this game, it's going to be a low scoring game, and not on the back of Fajardo. But man, the guy had two minutes left, and he did it. Shout out to Montreal. Congrats. <laughs> yeah. So with this team, many people are talking about dynasty beforehand. Clearly not. No. Um, are we at the end of the line with this core? Is it time to move forward? 2024, what to do uh, to get back to the Grey Cup with the Bombers? Like looking forward, what are you thinking? I don't think it's the end of the line for a lot of these guys, but there will be some changes that need to be made. You do need to get a little bit younger here in certain places. Um, who knows what's happening with Stanley Bryant? Apparently he just basically walked out of the dressing room, didn't talk to anybody. Um, so that might be a, a tough loss for him, knowing that he was probably, you know, playing his last game. Uh, again, the biggest thing, what's going on with Kyle Walters right now before any of this gets decided, is he going to sign and be GM or do they have to go in a different direction there? But I think guys are going to need to change. That D-line needs to get better. That D-line needs some depth. Uh, maybe Jake Tom Jake Thomas and uh, Walker and Cam Lawson didn't step up when Jeff Code and Jefferson couldn't. You know, when they were getting blocked, those guys needed to come in and make a play, and they have not for, like, the last few weeks, really. So I know a couple, I guess, sorry, I guess a couple in BC, but that was it. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I don't think they need to blow it all up, but some changes here and there. 
Yeah, it's so tough with a team like this. And with you know, that's the thing with the CFL and dynasties. It's so hard to do it when guys are on one, two-year contracts. Uh, I think going into next year, they have Caleros, Lawler, Dembski, Big Hill, and Kolinkowski as starters signed. That's a lot of talent, including Oliveira, and you'd trust that he will sign. Uh, with the loyalty the club has shown him and how much he loves home. But then you got Schoen, Jefferson, Houston, home, Newfeld. Uh, will he stay on? Parker, Hardrick, Jeff Coat, all these guys that will be in contract negotiations. He was in Jefferson who, who sign? I thought Not he signed Garrett. a three year or a two year or something deal. I don't think it was a three year. Maybe two, wasn't it? I'll have to double no. check. I don't yeah. think he's signed. I, I felt like he was, but I could be wrong too. I hope it's so. Hard, it's hard because there's no have cap to worry friendly about for it. the CFL. <laughs> so that's the thing. There's so many names that they have to sign. Who are you going to keep? You know, t- uh, do they have to get younger in certain positions other than O-line, which I think they prove that you don't have to. I don't think so. Age was never an issue going into the Grey Cup for me. Going into the last bits of the season, them being tired. I never see it, saw this team as tired. Uh, injuries, definitely. Uh, but Sean's a young guy. He got injured. Big Hill. That's a tough loss. So I don't know if age was an issue for me and they have to get younger anywhere. I think as long as they bring quality talent and I have no problem with what age they are, uh, just I guess, have I to mean, be sharper. Look, look at you have Sankey to be sharper. And, look at Sankey and Lemon. They're not young guys and they came in and played very well down the stretch. Yeah. Young teams in the CFL, it's not like the NFL, you know, where you're benefiting with all these rookie contracts. Nah, if you have a good core CFL veterans like the Bombers been able to keep together, that's the key here. So... I'm sure they'll be able to keep a lot of them, but how many will want to stay in regards to retirement? Um, how many will want to at least explore free agency? Who knows? Yeah, because even Jeff, Jeff Coat the last few years has been kind of, last couple years even, you know, later a bit of a later signing and he's kind of deciding his future. So he could be another one that walks away uh, from the game as well at this point. So the DBs, um, they look good throughout the year. They did not look good yesterday, so there, there's some question marks there. What do you do? I, I know you got to keep Evan home because he's a young guy, and he actually played per- very well this year. So there'll be some decisions to make back there because, yeah, these guys have now made four great cups in a row. Some of these guys are going to be like, hey, loyalty's there, but I also want to get paid kind of like Kenny Lawler did last year, right? So yeah. then you can't begrudge them for for wanting to get paid somewhere else because the Bombers are going to be pretty strapped to be able to sign all these guys back. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting. Biggie again, what, what's his injury here, right? Is he going to be back for the start of next season or is it going to be linger into the season as well? So you, you have to find mm-hmm. that option there. Goche did all right. Uh, he, he made some good plays yesterday, but he also missed some plays yesterday. So yeah, we'll see what they do. Um, yeah, some big decisions it is, is Buck Pierce and Richie Hall both coming back as well. We'll see. We'll see. That's huge. Uh, I kind of like the DB talent that they had. I don't like they they weren't perfect, but I really didn't like the coverage they were playing for most of the game. I'm putting that on Richie Hall as much love as I gave him all year. <laughs> the game of all games, I can't give him much love. I thought that coverage was soft and called at the wrong times. Like when you're leaving your DBs on an island uh, on that play where they went deep, uh, it's that's not fair. You know, that's bad coverage being called. Of course, it's instinctual for a DB. Oh, guys come across. They need five yards. I will take that step. And that's it. That left them deep. Yep. Like, that was just, for me, From the again, from a fan's point of view, not the best uh, defensive coordinator game this year for the Bombers. Do you think uh, after this performance by this Montreal D that Noel Thorpe uh, enters the conversation for Saskatchewan's head coaching job? Because, I mean, out of all these coordinators we talked about, um, having a chance, he was the best one throughout the playoffs. You know, Buck Pierce didn't really step up. Richie Hall, uh, Corey Mace, like a lot of these guys. Well, Mace wasn't really his fault, I guess. But, you know, maybe he steps into that conversation. He had a, he had this D on a good run. Yeah, he did. I don't know. Yeah. Be interesting to see. I guess they'll cut, probably head towards um, hiring someone soon, I guess, now. Or at least they start some to. interviews. Yeah. They have to. How do you write that halftime show, Green Day? I liked it. Um, I would give it maybe a 7 out of 10, though, um, just because it was music from my younger days and not music from today. Um, Maybe you attract, you know, you get us to kind of watch it and that, but the younger fans may not grow to the game or move towards the game just because of Green Day. But I thought they did a good job. And what's his name? Billy Joe Tolliver. He looked like he was freaking still in his 30s or 20s. Jeez. (laughs) 
I wasn't a huge Green Day fan when I was young. Like I thought they were great and all, but yeah, know, I wouldn't buy an album. I wouldn't no. buy a T-shirt. I'll give them an eight out of ten. It's great to hear them again. Don't know enough about their catalog. Like I wasn't like, oh, I wish they would have played because I don't know. They all sound the same to me. And again, that's not a knock on the genre. It's just that it's not my genre. But I'll still give it a solid eight out of ten. Looking back at other CFL Grey Cup halftime shows. If you can leave a voicemail, and this is our last little segment before we say goodnight for this Greek Cup review, goodness. If you could leave a voice message. <laughs> Did you say Greek Cup preview? <laughs> review. Review? Oh, sorry. <laughs> if you could leave a voice message for the Bombers organization, what would you say? I'd say, what the F? No, just kidding. Um, you know what? It all comes down to it. It was another great season. Uh, unfortunately, ends on another sour note. Um but I would just say, again, as a Bomber fan that didn't win for 29 years, it's, it's fun to actually be in these great cups. Yes, I'd like to have won every one of them. But I would just say thanks for another great season. Uh, sign Walters and keep this thing going for as long as you can. Yeah, thank you, Winnipeg Blue Bombers. We appreciate all you've done for the community, the great env- environment that you provide at IG Field. Um, I'm looking forward to next year already. I'm looking forward to the hype. I hope we can keep that shutout streak going like that should be the next goal going to the next season let's keep this shutout or shutout that would be amazing this sellout streak (laughs) going at ig field because you know being at ig field being packed all that noise was such a great time there's nothing i enjoy more in the summer than going to a, a bomber game yeah not lying and also stop with the slogans please do not do that again What's Goodness, next year's slogan going to be? It doesn't matter. <laughs> That's not my job. Just don't make it an anticipation coming, of winning you know a championship. <laughs> Benny, you have anything to say to our friends? Uh, you know what? Thanks a lot for listening. Uh, don't forget, subscribe, follow, and have a good day. Or a good couple of days. Good day. Good eve. <laughs> uh, you know what? Yeah, Bomber fans, thanks for joining us again during this Grey Cup frenzy. Our channel has grown so much, more than it ever has, and it's because of y'all Bomber fans. We can't wait to share more Bomber content with you. Please put in the comments below who y'all want to see on this show as an interview. We've done some great interviews with Bomber alumni, Jerron Bolden, James West, Willard Reeves, James Murphy, uh, Chris Walby. Like, we want to bring some more guys on. Katie Williams. (laughs) Anyone know Katie Williams out there? We Aging. want him on the show. You can Aging bring those Mr. teams. Yes, please. So anyways, <laughs> I've said enough. In the words of LeVar Burton, we'll see you next time. We'll see you next season. Yeah, we'll see you next week to talk about more Bombers, mofos. Hey, friends and neighbors, don't forget to check us out online on Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter at Ray Denny Sports. And don't forget to check out our YouTube channel. Leave a like, leave a comment, Tell us what you think.